Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dawn Handler, and I'm a Senior Fiduciary Officer with Members Trust Company. I'm a certified financial planner professional with over 25 years of experience in the trust and wealth management industry. And my role is to advise and support trust officers and other fiduciary representatives of Members Trust Company, primarily in the Western and Northwestern regions of the United States. My focus is on implementing guidelines and strategies that are designed to mitigate fiduciary risk. I also manage a personal book of complex estate settlement and trust relationships, including settlement preservation trusts, special needs trusts, and charitable trusts. I am a member of Members Trust Company's Special Needs Trust Administration Committee, and I am also a member of the Women's Estate Planning Council of Denver. In consideration of your comprehensive estate plan, today we're going to focus on the role of your last will and testament. Do you need a will? Wills are not just for the wealthy. If you die owning anything, whether it be real property, such as a car or house, or if you have financial assets that don't have a designated beneficiary, then you need a will to instruct who should receive your assets. You can leave monies to your favorite charity or designate who gets the family's prized art collection. In your will, you can designate the person who will act as legal guardian for your children or disabled adult. Via your will, you can also create a testamentary trust. A trust will allow you to control the distribution and management of your financial legacy to certain individuals over a long-term period. This is useful if you die leaving minor children or if you have a loved one with special needs that is incapable of managing their own financial affairs. There are several different types of wills. I will briefly touch on them. However, keep in mind that the very best will you can write is a testamentary will. This is the type of will we will be referring to in the presentation today. A testamentary will is prepared by you, you are also known as the testator, and then it is signed in the presence of witnesses. A testamentary will is arguably the best insurance against successful challenges to your wishes by family members or business associates after you die. You can write a testamentary will yourself, However, we strongly recommend that you have it prepared by an attorney who specializes in estate planning to ensure that it is worded precisely. There are no confusing or conflicting instructions, and it is in conformity with your state's trust and estate statutes. Another type of will you may have heard of is the holographic will. Holograph means that it was handwritten by its author. These types of wills are often used when time is short and witnesses are unavailable. For example, when the testator is trapped in a life-threatening situation. Holographic wills are not recognized in some states. However, in states that do permit the document, the will must meet minimal requirements, such as proof that the testator wrote it and had the mental capacity to do so. Even then, the absence of witnesses can often lead to challenges to the will's validity. Oral wills are the least recognized type of will. As you might guess, an oral will is one in which the testator speaks their wishes in front of witnesses. Since there's no written record to document the testator's wishes, courts do not widely recognize oral wills. I wanna share a true story with you about a client of mine that had a holographic will. We'll call this gentleman A.B. A.B. was a homeless man whose life was affected by one of our country's mass shooting events in 2019. He and his wife were in the wrong place at the wrong time near a major shopping center when a gunman opened fire, killing 20 people. A.B.'s wife was among the dead and A.B. suffered non-life-threatening injuries. A.B. received a small settlement due to the loss of his wife, which was to be held in a trust account and used to pay for his living expenses and out-of-pocket medical expenses. It's important to know some background about A.B. Both he and his wife were chronically homeless. They had no children. However, A.B.'s father was still living at the time of his death. A.B. suffered from substance abuse issues and physical disabilities. His mental faculties were permanently compromised, largely due to a life of hard living. After the shooting, A.B. befriended an attorney we'll call R.S. Two years after the shooting, A.B. died from terminal cancer and his dying wish was to travel out of state to visit his father one last time. However, that wish went unfulfilled. Just four months before his death, attorney RS convinced AB to write a holographic will. Upon AB's death, th this will was presented to the court. 
let me share the contents of the will with you. The first paragraph states that A.B. leaves, quote, any money left in his trust account to his good friend R.S., unquote. He goes on further to state that R.S. may dispose of his personal possessions however he wishes and that he requests that R.S. serve as his independent executor. Does anyone see any red flags in the story? It is a known fact that A.B. had diminished cognitive capacity per the testimony of his many caregivers. A.B. left all of his assets to his new attorney friend and not his own father. Is that what he really wanted? We may never know as there are no witnesses to the will to testify to A.B.'s cognitive capacity or ensure that he did not write this will under duress. Why would a qualified, reputable attorney not properly draft a typed document that conforms to the state law and have A.B.'s signature witnessed? R.S.'s actual attorney state by record is shown on this site. Notice that he has been suspended from practicing law twice. The reason was due to professional misconduct. The moral of this story, hire an attorney that specializes in estate planning to draft a properly written testamentary will in accordance with the laws of your state. What are the pitfalls of not establishing a will? Without a will, you leave no formal instructions on the disposition of your estate. This leaves your wishes up to interpretation. You may think that when you die, your children will all be on the same page regarding how your assets should be distributed. However, this proves not to be the case time and time again. Do any of your loved ones that stand to inherit have money issues? Do you have a child whom you could see getting a divorce in the future? What about family tensions about religious beliefs? Have you ever financially favored any of your children during your lifetime? Have you remarried and do you have step or adopted children that you may or may not want to share equally in their inheritance? Do you have a child with special needs? What about substance abuse? Do you have minor children that need to be taken care of? Do you even have children? Do you have charitable intentions? Not only is it important to formally establish who gets what upon your passing, but it's important to direct who gets what and how they get it. Generally, children can inherit assets from your estate. However, state laws typically prohibit children from holding property or other financial assets in their name until they reach the age of majority, which is generally 18 years old in most states. If you are leaving financial assets to a minor, you can do so through your will by creating a testamentary trust. A testamentary trust will hold the assets and designate a person or entity to professionally manage them until the minor turns 18 and has legal access to them. A testamentary trust can also be created through a will for a loved one that may have physical, emotional, or developmental disabilities. The trust designates a person or entity, such as members trust, to manage and protect the assets for their lifetime, and the monies can only be used for specific purposes which you designate, such as health, education, maintenance, and support. When Michael Jackson died in 2009, his estate was worth $482 million. As for his net worth, according to documents filed in 2014 with the United States Tax Court in Washington, the IRS found that the King of Pop had a net worth of $1.12 billion. Michael Jackson's will instructed his mother, Catherine, would inherit 40% of his estate, his children would receive another 40%, and 20% was donated to charities. In his will, Michael Jackson created testamentary trusts for his children, Prince, Paris, and Blanket. The trust funded with approximately $33 million each, and he set it up so they would each get an allowance until they're 21 years old. It is reported that they received an annual allowance of a million dollars. When Michael's children reach the age of 30, they can have access to one third of their trust fund. They will get another chunk of their trust fund at age 35, and they can have the rest when they turn 40 years old. Even though most of us may never have or receive an inheritance of this size, how many of us know a family member who could benefit from receiving a monthly allowance instead of a lump sum inheritance? If you die intestate, that is, without a will, 
the state in which you resided in at the time of your death will oversee the dispensation of your assets, which it will typically distribute according to a set formula that is written into state law. Throughout today's presentation, I will share with you more stories of some famous people who died in test state, that is, without a will. Did you know that Martin Luther King Jr. died in test state? As a civil rights activist, he frequently received death threats. Even though he was assassinated over 50 years ago, his family is still fighting a legal battle regarding the control of his estate. Prince was twice divorced, unmarried, and had no children at the time of his death. However, he did have numerous full and half brothers and sisters. Two of his siblings predeceased Prince, one of whom had a child. These people and others claimed to be the rightful heirs to part of his estate. Since he didn't have a will, Prince didn't exercise his right to determine who would and would not inherit a share of his estate or which shares the heirs would inherit. It took six years for the courts to sort it all out. How does intestate succession work? This chart represents a common general distribution formula that most states impose. The specific example is the statutory formula for the state of Colorado. As you can see, generally, if you have children but are not married, then your children will inherit everything. If you are married and the only children you have are born of that marriage, then your spouse generally inherits everything. If you don't have a spouse or children, then your parents will inherit. If you have no spouse, no children, and no living parents, then your siblings will be next in line. Is this the succession plan that you would choose for your estate? Here's something else to watch out for. Because of community property or elective share provisions in some state statutes, if you were married and have children, the legal formula often results in half of your estate going to your spouse and the other half going to your children. For example, in Colorado, if your spouse is living and you have stepchildren, then your spouse will inherit a little over one half of your estate and your children and stepchildren will inherit everything else in equal shares. In Colorado, this only applies if you are married and have stepchildren. However, this is not the case in other states. This scenario can have grave consequences if your surviving spouse was counting on the bulk of your assets to maintain their standard of living. Unfortunately, we've seen situations wherein the executor of the estate was forced to sell the family home in order to generate cash and ensure the children receive their rightful share. Other times, the executor was forced to give a significant amount of funds to the children, leaving the spouse in a compromised financial position. If you don't have a will, further complications could ensue if your children are minors, as the court will appoint a representative to look after their interests. Do you want the court to appoint someone of their choosing to be the guardian of your children to oversee their inheritance? Dying in testate may have tax consequences too since a properly prepared will can reduce your estate tax liability. However, keep in mind that under our current tax law, federal tax would only apply if your estate is valued at $12,060,000 or more. Let's take a look at the estate of Jimi Hendrix, the legendary musician and considered by many to be the greatest guitarist of all time. Hendrix died on September 18, 1970, and he died without a will. He was 27 years old. At the time of his death, Hendrix had only $20,000 in his bank account, and he owed back taxes and other debts. Hendrix did not own any real property, and he was not married. The battle over his estate raged for over 30 years. Hendrix was a resident of New York when he died, and so that means that his estate would be distributed under the laws of that state, even though he died in Notting Hill, London. Because he was not married, New York law provided that Hendrick's estate passed to his surviving parent, his father. It did not matter that Hendrix was estranged from his father. It did not matter that the relative he was closest to was his brother. Without a will, Hendrick's actual desires were supplanted by the statutory or state intestacy laws. But that's not all. Hendrick's daughter tried to contest the will, but because her relation to Hendrix was not recognized in any court, she failed. In all, over 30 years of litigation ensued before Hendrick's estate was finally settled. In 2004, the Hendrick's estate was worth over $80 million. Have you heard of the famous book, The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo? Stig Larsson was the renowned Swedish writer of that novel. 
He was the second best-selling author in the world in 2008 and the top-selling author in the United States in 2010. Larson died of a heart attack in 2004. Consequently, according to the laws of Sweden, his estate was divided between his brother and his father. However, his partner of more than 32 years didn't receive a dime. Larson and his lifelong partner avoided marriage to keep a low profile because his frequent reports on extremist groups and the subsequent death threats he received were a danger to a married couple. If they had been legally married, she would have received a sizable portion of his estate. Let's take a look at the process of how administering and distributing your estate works. Upon your death, the person or entity that you name in your will to serve as your executor is formally appointed by the court. Their job is to collect your assets. The estate assets are comprised of any account or asset that does not have a designated beneficiary. This may include your bank accounts, investment accounts, retirement accounts, cars, vacation properties, mineral interests, your home, digital currency such as Bitcoin, and anything else that you own at the time of your death. All of your property must be accounted for in a formal court filing called the Inventory of Assets. At the conclusion of the estate administration, the executor must distribute the assets either directly to your beneficiaries or into a testamentary trust and then formally close the estate. Keep in mind that if you name a designated beneficiary on a life insurance policy, a bank or investment account or real property, these assets are not part of your probate estate and they pass directly to the designated beneficiary. Only probate assets are subject to the probate process since other assets, such as life insurance policies and IRAs, pass by operation of law to the designated beneficiary. Which is your Before the estate can be closed, the executor gives the probate court a final accounting. Since this is a lot of work that can quickly get complicated, executors need to be paid in order to be incentivized to take on this burden. And because many executors are lay people and not lawyers, Many times they hire an attorney to make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Both executors and probate attorneys are entitled to compensation pursuant to law, which is paid out of the decedent's estate. These fees are based on the gross, not the net value of the estate. And this is important. Debts are not included in determining fees paid to the attorney or the executor. Thus, if a house is a fair market value of a million dollars, for example, and it has a mortgage of 800,000, it is considered an asset with a value of a million dollars for purposes of calculating executor and attorney fees. Thus, it is quite possible that surviving spouse or children could be forced to liquidate or borrow against the family business to satisfy probate fees. Wrapping up your life affairs after your death, in fact, can be very complicated, and it is not without personal risk to the executor. It is important that you identify a person or entity, such as Members Trust, that has the expertise, time, resources, and impartiality required to fulfill their legal obligations. This slide illustrates the many responsibilities and steps necessary to administer your estate. A simple estate with just a few assets may be all wrapped up within six to eight months. However, more complicated estates can take one or more years to settle. Every state has certain filing requirements and deadlines for completing certain aspects of the process. Another famous person who died in test state is Sonny Bono. Married to his fourth wife, Mary Bono, Sonny met his early end in a skiing accident at a ski resort in South Lake Tahoe, California. Bono's lack of a will caused Mary Bono a lot of problems. She spent years battling lawsuits such as a claim from Cher herself that Sonny Bono owed her millions in unpaid alimony and child support. Also, a man named Sean Machu turned up and claimed to be Sonny's illegitimate son. He eventually retracted his lawsuit after a DNA request was tested. Remember Kurt Cobain? Grunge owes a lot to Kurt Cobain and Nirvana often called the flagship band of Generation X, Nirvana pioneered the grunge movement in America. They were highly successful throughout their somewhat short-lived musical career, but it couldn't help Kurt Cobain. The musician had always struggled with a deadly combination of narcotic dependence and mental illness. Eventually, he was overcome by his depression and committed suicide. 
He left behind a suicide note, but not a will. Due to intestacy laws, his wife Courtney Love became the administrator of his estate. However, it is worth noting that he may have been in the process of starting a divorce from Love. He just never got to it before he ended his life. Love handled his estate poorly and was involved in a lot of lawsuits that she raised against several important figures in Cobain's life. Eventually, her attitude caused her to become estranged from her daughter, Frances Cobain, who gained a portion of the estate. As you just learned, it's important to be thorough about who you choose to act as the executor of your estate. And we strongly recommend that you discuss this with your loved ones while you were in the process of drafting your will. It may or may not come as a surprise to find out that many folks don't inform the person or entity that they've chosen to be their executor. This can sometimes come qu as quite a shock as it is an emotionally charged issue. Let's walk through a typical scenario. You have three children and you name your eldest son, Joe, as your executor, but you don't inform any of your children. Your thought process is quite clear at the time. Joe is an accountant by trade, so he'll understand the numbers and treat everyone fairly. However, when Joe learns of his appointment after your passing, he feels overwhelmed. He doesn't know how to navigate the legal system. He's unaware that he must file your will with the court or notify creditors within a certain time frame. He doesn't have time to oversee the process of emptying and selling your home or facilitate the distribution of your personal property to your heirs. Joe has two teenage children that are active in sports and he spends every weekend traveling the tri-state area for soccer and volleyball tournaments. He also has a full-time job. He feels a lot of pressure to make sure he does everything just right for the benefit of his siblings. Joe is feeling the pressure. Consequently, he does not feel that he could properly and timely carry out your wishes, so he declines your appointment of executor and turns it over to someone else to handle, someone that you did not have a hand in choosing. The moral of this story is to always discuss the selection of an executor with your family or loved ones. Make sure that they are not only able to take on the responsibility of administering your estate, but also that they are willing to take it on. Speaking of willing and able, let's briefly review the considerations of appointing a trusted family member or friend to serve as your executor versus appointing a professional. Appointing someone close to you to serve as your executor has some benefits, and there are many times when this is the best choice. Examples include, if your estate is simple and most of your assets are located in a few places that are easy to reach, such as banking institutions or brokerage accounts, if your family structure is uncomplicated and the risk of someone contesting the will is minimal, or if you choose someone skilled and knowledgeable in tax planning or probate law. For many of us, however, choosing a professional to serve as your executor makes sense. You are relieving your loved ones of the burden and stress of strained relationships. Professionals are impartial, so they don't make decisions based on emotion, which can often cloud our judgment. Experienced professionals also have the time and resources to work on your estate every day for as many hours as it takes. Sometimes one employee will spend eight hours a day on the phone just calling your financial institutions to notify them of your death and then gathering and providing their required information so that the executor can access your accounts. Do you have four, six, or eight hours straight to spend on the phone? Professionals also have many resources at their fingertips that help them do their job and keep things moving. They know just who to call to appraise your Andy Warhol painting, which movers will responsibly dispose of your old laptop with the sensitive personal data, and which realtor has the best track record for selling homes in your neighborhood. Another advantage of hiring a professional institution is that there is quite a bit of corporate oversight. Contrary to executor Uncle Steve, who makes all the decisions on his own with no accountability and no one to call him out if a mistake is made, corporate executors such as banks and independent trust companies must report their activities to internal managerial boards and state and federal regulators. Howard Hughes, the eccentric billionaire, began as a producer in Hollywood in the late 1920s but eventually he greatly diversified his business interests. He is perhaps most famous for creating an aircraft company that built planes that broke airspeed world records. Hughes was also known for his odd behaviors and mannerisms, much of which may be attributable to his obsessive compulsive disorder. Hughes died on an aircraft in 1976. 
By that time, he was a reclusive drug addict living in a hotel in Las Vegas. Several wills were presented to the courts, but all were determined to be forgeries. One was a handwritten will presented to the court by a man who gave Hughes a ride in the desert back in 1967. Another was presented by a woman named Terry Moore who came forth alleging that she and Hughes were married off the coast of Mexico in 1949. She was paid an undisclosed amount of money to drop her suit. Another will was discovered at the Mormon church's headquarters in Salt Lake City. However, a Nevada court determined it was also a forgery. In 2010, more than 34 years after Howard Hughes' death, after decades of attorney's fees and taxes and administration of bankrupt properties, his estate was finally closed. Pablo Picasso was the inventor of constructed sculpture, the co-inventor of the collage and the co-founder of the Cubist movement. His artistic talent and discretion led him to explore many new styles, leading him to prominence in the world of 20th century artists. Picasso died during a dinner party that he was hosting with his wife. He left behind his wife, children, and grandchildren. As he had no will, his wife ended up taking control of the estate. She completely cut out Picasso's children and grandchildren from receiving anything from the estate. Sometime after that, she committed suicide. Even after his death, Picasso's descendants continued to fight over the rights to his name and signature. A final few thoughts on wills. As we previously learned, wills must be filed with the court and the process of administering your state is called probate. Probate is the court supervised process of administering a deceased person's estate. This process generally involves collecting and safeguarding your assets. We refer to this as marshalling assets paying debts and taxes, and finally distributing any remaining assets to family, friends, or charity. Probate gets the job done, but it is usually not the quickest, most efficient way to do things. In most states, you must file several different types of documents with the court. Some of these filings include lodging your will to start the process, sending notice to interested parties, filing an estate inventory, and publishing notices to creditors. Each time you submit something to the court for approval, it can take weeks, or even months in some cases, before the documents are reviewed by the judge and you are giving legal approval to move on to the next step in the probate process. Consider this analogy. The estate administration process is like passing through a toll booth. You have to drive through the booth to get to your destination. However, you have different payment options for passing through. If you get the fast pass, you glide right through the toll booth without stopping. The camera photographs your license plate and you are on your way. However, if you don't have the fast pass, you must get in line behind everyone else and wait your turn to pay with change. This is similar to the probate process. Your probate car cannot use the fast pass lane, so you end up in line. There are other executors ahead of you in line that have filed their probate paperwork with the court and you must wait until it's your turn before the judge reviews your paperwork. This takes time. However, if you have the revocable living trust fast pass, you can glide through the fast lane without stopping because you don't have to wait for anyone else to give you approval to move forward. So how can you alleviate the inherent problems caused by probate? The answer is to draft a revocable living trust, the fast pass. A revocable living trust is a legal contract similar to a will, but it requires no court oversight. It is less expensive to administer because the trustee does not have to file paperwork with the court on an ongoing basis, thus cutting out unnecessary legal expenses. It is quicker because the trustee doesn't have to wait for the judge's approval to be appointed as the administrator, and this will allow you to get your hands on the assets faster so you can pay immediate and ongoing expenses. Also, trust administration is private. The only people that are privy to the trust provisions are the parties named in the trust document. There is no way for neighbor I am nosy to see who's getting what unless she's been named a party in the trust agreement. For more information on benefits of a revocable living trust, please attend our webinar titled, A Will is Not the Only Way. We've covered a lot of information in this webinar today. And in closing, I want to inform you that there are many different ways that members trust can support you and your loved ones through the process of estate settlement and beyond. We have both products and services that will help you carry out your estate planning goals. We can serve as executor of your estate, trustee of your trust, 
and financial guardian or conservator for an incapacitated or special needs loved one. After this presentation, I will be available to answer any general questions about any of the topics that we've covered today. Before ending this presentation, I want to take just a few moments to share with you a little bit of background on Members Trust Company. We were founded in 1987 by a group of forward-thinking credit unions dedicated to providing an estate administration solution to their members. We're the only nationally chartered trust company owned by credit unions. However, you do not have to be a credit union member to work with Members Trust Company, as we serve clients from all walks of life. Our mission is to ensure that everyone in our community can access expert estate administration services, even if you are not as rich and famous as some of the celebrities that we highlighted in this presentation today. If you would like to reach out to us for further conversation, Members Trust currently has three regional offices serving clients in all 50 states, and even clients living abroad. In addition to our regional offices, we also have representatives staffed in local credit union branches across the country, providing trust and administration services to our clients. Please feel free to reach out to myself or any one of my team members should you have additional questions after today. And thank you for attending.